Okay, we are now recording. All right, everybody, good afternoon uh, or uh, good morning, depending where you're at, or good evening, <laughs> depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, it's uh, noon here in uh, the East Coast of the U.S., so uh, we'll get started now with our evolution of Roman warfare and wargaming with Romans uh, based on the uh, uh, Gloriam, uh, Gloriam uh, rules. Uh, I've got here, uh, uh, I'm Tom Burgess, with, work with No Dice, No Glory, but more importantly, we're joined here by uh, Mr. Simon Hall and Dr. Simon Elliott, uh, the two Simons, as you'll see up in the, uh, the SNS show up in the left corner. <laughs> So, uh, and they, they are with uh, a war game zone, uh, and, but also uh, work directly with the uh, Plastic Soldier Company, which is now uh, producing these rules and also offering a new line of, uh, of uh, plastic. What was the name again, Simon? Plasticast? Ultracast is the Ultracast, name. Ultracast, Ultracast. Yeah, there are, there are different plastic that's ever been used before. It's a new, right. new resin plastic combination. So it's quite interesting, actually. Yep. New tech to get hold of. So we're going to be going for at least an hour, uh, possibly longer, depending on how the conversation goes. And I do ask that the the, uh, the viewers uh, make sure your your cameras off and your your mics are off, so that we we don't take up too much bandwidth here, and we can concentrate on the team here. And without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Simon and Simon. Hello, everybody. Delighted to be joining you. We were uh, we were at about this time due to be in the States, the historic on running some demo games. So uh, a big thank you to AGS for organizing these types of events. I think in this weird COVID era, it's rather nice for us all to manage to gather from all over the world, whatever. So well done, everybody. And we're just delighted to be involved. And, and everybody also, if uh, you have specific questions as you go along, uh, use the chat bar. I will try to filter those questions into the, the two Simons as they make sense and what, it, what they're covering at that current point in time during the presentation. Okay, so having set us the challenge of making sense, we'll give it a good go. Um, what we're going to do, we could do it in, in sort of two stages in the joint stage. Um, Simon Elliott, Dr. Simon Elliott, who's with me, friend of mine and uh, a great war gamer, great author, writes a load of books about Roman history. If we could flick forward one slide, Tom, I'll just, uh, I'll just blast everybody. I won't go through them all, but um, there's a whole series of books you can see on the left he's working on. This, the, the, the one uh, top left, I think it's fair to say, is, a, is that one the one that's about to come out, Simon, that uh, I've seen some of the proofs of that looks amazing? That's the one that's costing me sleep at the moment, Simon, because I'm proofreading it. It's 100,000 words. That's what I thought. That's what and, I coffee, thought. and coffee table size with 250 color plates. It's out in September. And uh, it's going to be beautiful. So I'm just making sure with the final proofread of the manuscript, it's going to be immaculate as well. There we go. And for my part, I've been a, I've been a war gamer uh, 45 years and a rule creator probably for 35 of those because I just liked doing it when I was young. But probably most recently uh, known for having invented Mortimer Glorium and the color system within it, which, is, uh, which took off quite well a few years ago and is now being published by PSE in a very professional form uh, and it's just about hitting the states in fact I think the, the first stock landed last week in the US so the shops are starting to stock it as well so uh, we're, get, we're going to work through in two stages um, Simon is a great historian of the Roman era as you can see most of those books are about the Roman era uh, he does uh, he does some great stuff about the history and the evolution of the eras of Rome and then I'm going to talk about one of my aspirations when I created the rules, uh, which was to try and make all armies feel right. And one of the great challenges of that to me was to try and make the different eras of Rome feel right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We do a show now, which we've been doing for a few months, one a month. We pick a, a big historical battle and have a blast on a webinar with a load of questions and play bits of games live and see how they look versus historical results. So the two of us are going to team up later and tell you a little bit about what's happened in the first four of those. And uh, we're happy to stop and take questions at any time all the way through. And uh, especially now we've been told we've got a little bit of spare time. We're not limited to the hour. Uh, certainly I'm very happy to chat about wargaming for long periods of time, as people know. So on that happy note, Dr. E, shall I pass over to you to work us through the eras of Rome? Bye. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. So, so uh, when I talk about the evolution of the Roman military system, remember that we're talking about three principal periods of Roman history. We're talking about the Republic, 
and then we're talking about the Principate Empire, and then we're talking about the Dominate Empire. So the Republic is from 709 BC, with the overthrow of Tolkien the Proud, through to 27 BC, when uh, the Senate first acknowledges um, Octavian as Augustus, and that initiates the Principate Empire. This lasts through to AD 284, at the end of the crisis of the third century, when uh, Diocletian to rescue the empire from the, predate, pre um, from the predations of the crisis of the third century has to drag it kicking and screaming into a totally new form of empire which we call the dominate. So we go republic, principate empire, dominate empire. And at each stage the evolution of the Roman military is a different thing. We see different kinds of troops being used and certainly that most iconic of Roman warrior, the legionary, is different in each of the phases. And we'll demonstrate that today for you and we'll show you how the flexibility and the accuracy from a historical perspective of Mortimer Glorium can really help recreate dif the differing flavours of this legionary. So, so to look at this chronology briefly to give you a flavour of what Simon's going to talk about in terms of the wargaming aspects of the Roman military. Uh, first off I'll talk about the two key traits which the Romans had above all of their opponents, friends, enemies, etc., throughout the entirety of the existence of the Roman Empire. The first one was grit. So the Romans always came back from defeat and they learned from it and they eventually almost always overcame in the end. Think of the Second Punic War when they were on their knees fighting Hannibal in Italy, but ultimately in 202 BC, they won the Battle of Zama. Uh, but also in terms of that grit, they also had this almost unique ability amongst their contemporaries to nick the best ideas. So the best tactics and the best technologies of their opponents uh, were most often nicked and then incorporated by the Romans as part of this learning experience, the grit. So the classic example would be the Caesarian legionary in his Gallic helmet, the clues in the name, it's a Gallic helmet nicked from the Gauls. The Lorica Hamata chain mail, it's armor nicked from the Gauls. The Pilum javelins, well, lead weighted javelins, they're nicked as an idea from the Spaniards or the Etruscans. The Gladius Hispaniensis, the clues in the name, it's a Spanish sword. The scutum, the key, the, this key huge body shield, that's nicked from the Samnites. So the Romans had, had no qualms whatsoever in terms of nicking the best tactics and technologies of their opponents to eventually overcome. So to um, elegantly sort of move from there to talk about the chronology of the evolution of the Roman military, we begin with um, the early Republic and we begin with the reforms of Servius Tullius, um, who was the sixth king of Rome. So this is the middle of the uh, sixth century and he's the first to initiate this system of classes within Roman society which is reflected in the Roman military. And the first class warrior the legionary, although it wasn't called that at the time, uh, of this system, the Tullian system, was the Greek hoplite because um, Tullius was an Etrusco um, Roman king. And the Etruscans themselves had most ideas from um, the uh, Greeks in Magna Gracchia to the south. And one of the things they most as an idea was the hoplite as the elite warrior. So the first elite warriors of the Roman legions were hoplites, just as you would have found in Greece. Then we move this system all the way through to the shock to the Roman world when uh, the Senones Gauls defeated the Romans at the Battle of Allia in a, uh, 390 BC and then sacked Rome. This was so shocking that the leading military and political leader of the time, Camillus, completely reformed this military system he'd inherited into what we could see now for the first time as being a legion. So he, he introduced the manipular system. And these are incorporating three principal troop types who are the Hastati and the Principi, the troop type which eventually comes to have the Scutum shield and the two Pilum, and also the Triari who are the older elite warriors. Um, and this system, the Manipular Legion, continues through until the wars against Pyrrhus of Epirus in the 280s BC, when again the Romans have a shock to their system because they come up against the Hellenistic military system for the first time with its pike-based phalanx, with its lance-armed shock cavalry, and with its war elephants, which is a very scary thing for the, the Romans to come across for the first time here. And the, um, the Manipular system of Camillus evolves into the Manipular system slightly different, which we call the Polybian system. One of the key uh, innovations here by 209 BC is the introduction of bespoke specific skirmishing infantry, the Velites. So this is a, a, a more flexible system still based on maniples. But again, the Romans evolve 
next in the context of losing. So this is in the 120s, 110s, 100s BC when we have the Cimbrian Wars with the Teutons and the Cimbri, Cimbri coming down from the very far north of Germany into Gaul, coming into conflict with the Romans. And over a 15 year period, the Romans lose again and again and again of a scale similar to the losses that they suffered in the Second Punic War against Hannibal. And this initiates another series of reforms. This is a key reform. This is the reforms of the great uh, seven time consul Marius. And he introduces the century based legion, which for the first time pays a wage to the legionaries who become uh, professional soldiers serving a set term and formalizes the equipment of each legionary, as I've early described with the Caesarean legionaries in that panoply there. And this is the system that goes all the way through into the Principates. The main difference in the first century AD and the second century AD is the predominance in terms of the armor panoply of the uh, uh, legionary with the Lorica Segmentata banded iron armor. Um, so there we go. That is the evolution of the Roman legionary, this core iconic warrior, through to the end of the Principate phase of empire. Do you want to go to the next screen, Simon? So, so what we can see here is the development of then this elite warrior, the, the legionary, through to the end of the empire in the west, AD 476, on this page. Um, from the beginning of the, the Principate, one of Augustus's key reforms, in addition to creating regional fleets, was to formalize the status of supporting troops in the Roman military establishment as auxilia. So from this point onwards, we talk about the Roman legionary and the Roman auxilia. And the legionary I've just described with his Lorica Segmentata, with his really fine uh, Gallic helmet, with his Gladius, with his Pugio dagger, with his Scutum, with his two pillums. This goes through all the way through to around the time of Septimius Severus, and especially the time of Septimius Severus when he creates the first Roman field army to invade Scotland in AD 210 and uh, AD 209 and AD 210. Now, the key thing here is that the creation of this army sets a trend which as the Principate comes to an end and the Dominate begins, leads to the formation of, into the Dominate, the main change, okay? And this is the creation of field armies and border forces. The field armies are called Comitatenses, the border forces are called Limitani. The Comitatenses become the, the elite warriors. By this time, there's very little difference. This is going to the Dominate, so we're talking about the time of Diocletian, Constantine the First. There's very little difference between the Auxilia and the Legionaries. In fact, some of the most elite units in the, the Roman military are actually Auxilia Palatina, um, who often are better than the Legionaries. And it's this system which goes through all the way to the end of the um, Roman Empire in the West. One final key change to point out is that in Republican and Principate armies, the mounted arm of the Roman military establishment and their armies was secondary to their infantry. But by the time you get into the dominate, especially the later dominate, the mounted arm is much more important and you get more and more different types of cavalry coming into existence to tackle the numerous new foes which the Romans are fighting by this time, the Goths, the Germans, the Sasanid Persians in the East, etc. So, so there I've given a flavour, I'm happy to take any questions later. One point I will make though, Simon, is one of the great things about Mortem McGlorian, which you're going to come on to, is the system of capabilities, but also uh, uh, the, the, the idea that each troop type isn't just a standalone troop type. It's got things it can do or not do, which mean, and I know you're going to go through this, which mean that you can give them a very distinct flavour. So all those different types of legionaries I've described, all the way from the hoplite, all the way through to the uh, later legionaries and the auxiliary palatina, you can give them uh, things which you're going to describe, which you can actually reflect the very nature within the rules, make it not only fun to play, but historically accurate. Over to you, Simon. It's always nice as a rule creator that you find a historian who's knowledgeable who says something like that, which is always nice. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you pull us on to the next uh, slide, Tom, we thought just before we move on between us, we can just uh, show you a little bit from various collections what some of these look like for uh, any of you who haven't seen lots of Romans from different areas. A lot of people have seen one image of a Roman legionary and it's stuck in their head. Uh, but just to pick up what Simon's saying, when you go back to the Tullian era, they really wouldn't be very different to these. I mean, they, they, for all intents and purposes, you would see something that was uh, what you would imagine to be a hoplite. You know, they might have coordinated shields that are slightly different, but they are long spear armed troops. And when you move on from there to the Camelon one, you start to get this manipular system, this organization, but it's still, it's a sort of blend of new Roman organization and old style equipment and armor. 
it's, it's built very much based around a lot of long spears. And then you get into the next one, and I'm not going to apologize for these because I love them because it's a nostalgia blast. These are my 1979, <laughs> that, that painted 1979, 28 millimeter minifigs, uh, mid Republican Romans. So you see the, the big shield, they start to be pillar, pillar mom. They have a triari third rank, which you can just see behind there. Actually, if you look at the front ones, there's five bases, one at the back, which is how we represent a legion in Meg at that time. A starty front rank. Um, Principe second rank, a single base from Trier at the back. Uh, there's even our comedy, our comedy version of Caesar sitting in there at the back. But you'll see the long, <laughs> lost rich blooms were quite characteristic. Um, so, so they have a particular type of weaponry. Are they, are they, they're wearing chain mail at the front, brass plates for some of them. If you roll it on, Tom, we'll just keep rolling and it gives you a visual picture of what's going on as you move through. You then go to more the late Republican. These again are some of, some of mine. These are Marian Romans. So if you look at them now, they've, they've got the big scutum shields, they're all pillar armed, and, and they're wearing a different style of helmet now, that is more, as Simon said, more, more picked up towards the Gallic helmets are coming in. And then you get the classic. This is the probably, if, if you ask people to describe a Roman legion, you only just ask them to describe one. I guess the one on the right is the one a lot of people would go for. It's the famous one with the Lorica Segmentata armor, the sort of lamella stripped armor with the, with the fantastic rectangular scutums and the sort of test studio area. So that's the, that's the early imperial stage of Rome. And if we flick forward one more, and now we'll get into the later bit. So if you get into the, into the later end of the Romans, so you're entering the decline and fall era, the dominant era, the legionaries and auxiliaries, as Simon said, weren't, weren't very different. Actually, if you, for those of you who are on Ultracast that was mentioned earlier, um, those previous ones are all my 28 mil, or mainly my old 28 mils. These are brand new plastic Ultracast 15 mil figures here on the left. So if you want to know what they look like, that's what they look like. And I'm just painted, I, I've just painted those now. Simon, I've just painted those now, actually. I can tell you now, they're an absolute joy to paint. No yeah, flash no, whatsoever. Very, we're very proud of them. The plastic is quite an incredible plastic for wargaming, actually. Uh, you'll see, actually, if you look at that one, there's a figure in the front rank in the middle there who's throwing a plumbata. That's actually the dart that was introduced in the later era. We're smack in the middle of the line there. The others are a javelin arm. So they're a real interesting mix and the helmets have evolved again. And when you get to the very late Federati, I put this one in just to remind people that by the time you got to that stage, it was pretty much anything goes, actually. The Roman armies were full of all sorts of people gathered from all sorts of tribes. And if Rome could afford to equip them, they might do. But if Rome couldn't afford to equip them, they'd, they'd fight in their own historical style. By this actually, time, you've got... I, 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 actually, Simon, it's, it's worth reflecting. There's a, there's a historical angle we can pick out here in terms of um, Mortimer Glorium as well, because the figure, the, the image on the left, you've got the um, uh, Plastic Soldier Company, our um, late Roman, the legionaries are all Dilia Palatina. Um, most of those units in the Auxilia Palatina, if that is they, they were actually Germans and Goths themselves. One of the things that's come out of my research, they recruited entire tribes. So you tend to find in the primary sources when they're talking about the capabilities of these troops being very good, they had the same sense of Elan as because they came from one tribe or even a greater sense of Elan than sort of a classic Principate legionary. Yes, I can. Ah, that's really interesting you say that because in the... Uh... Um, in the earlier period, in the member Republican rear in, in the battle we were doing when we looked at uh, Cannae, it was very notable that they struggled to raise enough legions. And of course, you've got the Roman professional soldier with sort of the right to be a legionary. And then you always had their Italian allies, which seemed to have a little bit less cohesion. So it's interesting. You're saying they raised them from tribes. And by having a tribe, they sort of recreated the feeling of being a, a, a Roman of a different type. Let Absolutely, and if you, if you look at if you look at Julian's um, uh, line of battle at Strasbourg, it's very specific, giving names to each of the legions and each of the units of Auxilia and Auxilia Palatina, and the names of the Auxilia Palatina that they're given are actually bespoke names for specific German and Gothic tribes. Yes, and uh, with the release of these rules, Plastic Soldier Company is offering uh, uh, box sets to go with them. Could you explain the uh, the contents of the box sets and give us an idea what the cost is? Sure. The um, the 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 Baltimore Glory and game when you when you when you get it in compendium form has got three sizes of game. So it, it's played on bases. Any basing system can work. The smaller game is about twenty to thirty bases. So for those of you who can go back in history through lots of ancient rules and enjoy playing D DBA, say when it came out as a simple twelve base game, it's kind of double DBA size. And then uh, then Magna is is about double that. 
And the Maximus, the big game, which we like to play at the competitions a lot, is 70 to 90 base. It's kind of the size of a classic WRG army through the years for a full sable size. The, uh, the Plastic Soldier Company box sets are starter box sets that give you a fully self-contained pack to army in a box. So they, uh, they, they will have some combination of, I think at peak, maybe 100 and you could get 120 odd infantry in there or you could get 60, 60 cavalry in there. There'll be some mix between those. And there's a design that's ready made that you can paint up and put together and it will give you a ready made 3000 point army for any one of the armies. And there are four box sets out um, live at the moment that came out to support the launch. We've got the late Roman legionaries. We've got the Goths and the Huns, which means you can fight the famous battle at Shalon or Catalonia Plains with those. And we also have the Sassanid Persians, one of the classic enemies of these late Roman uh, legionaries. In fact, one of the reasons they introduced a lot of throwing weapons was because they faced a lot of missile fire opponents who didn't close with them. So uh, they learned to do that. Whereas earlier in the empire, when they faced, say, the Parthians, they didn't have anything like the amount of missile fire. And at Carai, this is where the historian can correct me if I'm wrong, but at Carai, if I remember rightly, the light horse actually wore them down over about two days. Yeah. And then eventually the cataphracts charged them and crushed them on the third day. And they basically could not shoot back. So it's a great example of the Romans learning we have to be able to shoot back. How do we design our legionaries now to shoot back at these people? And, and that, that image over there is a perfect example. You, there are two more that have just come out, actually uh, launched yesterday. There's an early Imperial Roman and a Gallic Ancient Brittany box as well. So within it, you get a full set. I think the, uh, the late Roman army, if I remember right, that you end up with 12 bases of legionary auxilia, four bases of cavalry, I think four bases of light horse, two bases of, of late Roman cataphracts because as, as Simon says, they started to reduce more cavalry. So again, these people, enemy on horses, we need to catch them. Let's, let's start using more horses. They did that. And then uh, you have some skirmishing archers and it com completes a, a, a complete set in terms of an army. Yep. You mentioned earlier that uh, the base size, is any, so long as you're using a standard, I guess any base size will do. But what is the recommended base size and do these box sets include those bases? The, the bases, um, PSC have just ordered a load of bases so you can buy them from the same place, but they're box standard MDF bases that people buy everywhere. The standard size we use is compatible with all recent, the recent base rules. So it's a 40 mil frontage for 50 mil, 60 mil frontage for um, 28 mil. But there's a video on YouTube I've done. I've got figures based in all sorts of ways in my collection. So we've got players play, playing with them with double size impetus style bases. It works perfectly fine. We've got piece of people playing with individual figures. It works fine. The rules are written in base with deliberately so that if you and a friend have an army you've based a particular way, your only decision is what you decide is the base with and then everything will work. It colors all falls into place. Very good. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Let's, let's roll on. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more if we move on uh, about Romans as a, as a rule designer. And when I set out to do more to make Lauren, um, I've been involved in some rule writing before and I've played ancient since WRG fourth edition. So I, I go back a reasonably, reasonably long way. And I had several objectives when I set out to do more to glory. I want to do something that was very original. I wanted to do something that was a great fun game but I also wanted to have it have the best historical feel I could find. And I always had this feeling when I played a lot of armies in the past that Romans didn't really necessarily feel like Romans or Huns didn't feel like Huns or for sure one of my favorites, the Samurai never felt like Samurai. So what I, what I managed to do is by designing a sort of innovative way to do combat and movement based on a color system that's relatively easy to grasp and therefore doesn't absorb too much brain power, I managed to put quite a lot into the character of the troops. And when it comes to making Romans feel like Romans, if you, if you just scroll that up ever so slightly for me, Tom, so I can get the bottom of the page on screen. That's perfect, got it. So there's a whole raft of things in the way we classify troops that allow you to bring Romans to life. So the first thing in there is when it comes to drill and how things maneuver, I, I look to back about a lot of my reading of armies and decided actually three, not two, was a good idea. So the first thing we have, we used to have drilled, formed, and tribal. We have three levels of, of, of drill that cuts in. And you'll see that arrive a little bit later, even in the Romans. They're not all drilled, which is interesting. 
formations, we stuck with the terms of close loose skirmish, but I invented something called flexibles. And flexibles creates a, a troop type which can switch if it's infantry between close and loose order. So it can actually fight in terrain reasonably well. It has the method to fight in terrain reasonably well. And if it's mounted to switch between loose and skirmish. Now think about Roman auxilia and the classic challenge. Every, for, for years we've, we've had debate, are they close order, are they loose order? Let's be honest, loose order is a term invented by war gamers. It's not something you see in written history. I think the reality is you have standard fighting methods. You have clustering tightly together and you have skirmish. That's, that's actually more the reality. But for years, it's been very difficult to classify auxilia. But the minute you have this flexible, you can classify them in the way that they actually operate it. Designed to fight in the open, tight together like a pseudo legionary or spread out and fight man to man open in terrain. Same with the Huns. The Huns, we all think of their skirmishers, but actually they group together to charge and finish people off at the end. So this invention of flexible allows us a way of actually dealing with troop types. We then have weaponry, a various range of weaponry. So we, we have a classification for the pillar, which is an impact weapon, something you throw at very short range to create an immediate impact before contact. We have long spear, short spear, and we have javelins, and we have darts in there explicitly. Like all rules, we have grades. We have four. We'll muck around with those as we go through a little bit. And then the bit that really brings it to life is we came up with a whole series of characteristics that you can apply to certain troop types or not to give them a feel. And I'm going to work through these one by one. They're all quite important and you'll see how they bring Romans to life. Shield cover. Shield cover is a characteristic of troops that had large shields that could effectively lock them together to protect them from missile fire. So if you think of the classic testudo that we have images for as being the ultimate in shield cover, that kind of works. They're locked together and they're designed to protect from, from firepower. It'll slow you down to do it, so there's a compensating effect in the game, but you will suffer less casualties. Other troops with big shields and that capability get that as well. So for instance, the, uh, um, the Spartans at Thermopylae have shield cover, which actually gives them a chance of lasting a long time against a lot of Persians with arrows. What happens? So Romans with big shields are coordinating if they're and it's not just having a big shield, it's having the coordination of skill to do it. Melee expert. Melee expert is a category for people who had some expert sword skill and capacity to excel in man-to-man -man fighting. This is clearly one of the Romans' great things of history with its gladius and method of shield and gladius combined fighting. The push with the shield and the stab over the shoulder or the push and the stab under into the gut were well-perfected methods for the Roman legionaries best to, to utilise, in addition to being quite capable of doing an individual person-to-person -person fight. Shoot and charge is a characteristic for people who would use missile weapons immediately before a charge. So troops that were adept of approaching at close range, throwing a, throwing a load of javelins and immediately going into combat. This is what a lot of Roman auxilia were designed to do. Integral shooters is a characteristic of people who had some firepower added to their troops but weren't really true missile troops. They would add a line of bowmen, usually to give them extra firepower to protect them against mounted attackers. And they would, they would give you extra factors when you're being charged. Shove is a capability for heavy troops in tight formation to push back a file of enemy that are in looser formation and therefore give a benefit to their neighbours. So it's like driving a wedge into an opposing line. Orb square, you can probably figure out, turn back to back and fight back to back to save your neck and hang on as long as possible or block the territory. And then we have one that applies for all called combat shy, which we use to weaken the fighting power of some of the less good troops in all armies where they were um, not particularly strong. So the trick with, with Meg is that we've got a very simple system in individually. There's nothing complicated about any individual bit, but it's kind of like a recipe book. By looking at it as a recipe book, we can have a bit of paprika and we can have some black pepper and a bit of chili and we can throw them in a pot and give them a shake and out pops something really interesting. And you go, that's got a character that's very different to the minestrone soup over there. And that's what I really wanted to achieve because I, I love Romans, but for many years I never played them because they didn't feel like Romans. And actually, they all felt the same as well. There was no real... I think we lost your mic there, uh, Simon. <laughs> Yep, 
Yeah, unmute. I don't know how that happens. Am I back? Yep, you are. You're back. Sorry about that. Did you lose me? Wait, you lose me. Since we got a, uh, a quick pause there, we did have a question that uh, uh, one of uh, viewers seems to have answered already. It was asking about the, uh, since you talked about the integral shooters, uh, what the likelihood that they would have slings, slings for the um, uh, Romans? And, uh, uh, Simon, shall I take that? You take that, yeah. Uh, if you can hear a, a, a dog, um, if you can hear a dog snoring in the background, that's my golden doodle Hector, who I might introduce to you a little bit later. Um, so if we go back to uh, some of the um, earlier sort of rule sets and things we, 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 we pl we, we've, um, uh, we, we played, what I'll do here, Simon, is I'll, I'll cue you up to explain how we do this within Meg, okay? So if we go back to some of the old WRG sets, some of the auxilia were given a sling as well as their other weapon, which is actually very historically accurate because one of the things which I found in my research, you can see it writ large actually in the, the, the town walls in Pompeii where I take tours, uh, is that the Romans tended in, in sieges to use slings en masse to bombard parapets to keep the heads of the defenders down while the, uh, the legionaries usually form the testudo to force a gate and, uh, and um, enter wherever they want to attack. The reason they chose to use a sling, probably backed up by ballista, but principally the sling as opposed to the arrow or the javelin, is that the sling doesn't need to make a penetrating wound to actually incapacitate an opponent. A sling shot, a lead sling shot, well made, as the Romans would have been, is effectively like a sort of a low velocity um, pistol bullet. And if it hits you on the head, it's going to knock you out. If it hits you on the arm, it's going to break your arm and send you into shock. So if you look at the, the, the walls of Pompeii, which are made from a fairly soft volcanic rock, especially around the Herculaneum Gate, where Sulla forced the walls during the social war when he besieged it and then sacked Pompeii. Uh, the walls are full of holes made by a slingshot. It's almost like it's been machine gunned. And we have evidence in uh, the Scottish borders from the Antonine period in the mid second century AD of a hill fort there, again being uh, besieged and stormed by the Romans. So this is in the mid Principate. And again, most of the missile weaponry which is found in the archeological record is slingshot doing exactly the same thing as they did at Pompeii all that time before, bombarding the parapets to keep the heads of the defenders down while the legionaries themselves stormed uh, in Testudo, the gateways. So Simon, how do we recreate that in, in Meg? So, so the Romans created suppressive fire then? They well. did, they did, they did. On top of everything else. So yes, in, in Meg, what we have with missile capabilities is um, if you have enough of them to justify being able to shoot all the time, you will have the actual weapon itself. So sling is one of the weapons that's in there. And you'll have, actually, and this is very important, you have three separate grades of shooter, normal shooter. You have unskilled, experienced, skilled. So we can separate out in these rules troops that were not very good in melee, but were actually very good at shooting. I'll give you my best example, I think, from history, having loved them for years, but never got them to work until now, is Numidian Light Horse. Numidian Light Horse were renowned in, in, in part of this history as the best mercenaries to have because they were superb with javelins on horseback and they were great horsemen. But they really were not terribly strong in a fight. They wanted to break things mainly through the skirmishing. So we could make them very ordinary light horse, but skilled javelin, and suddenly they become dangerous. And that's the first time I've found them would be dangerous enough to have them do the real job they did at Kanai, for instance. So we, by separating them, we do it. So the decision we have to make is, did they have enough of the actual weapons and use them enough to justify full firepower? And where we do, we would give them sling experience. In fact, interestingly, in the Imperial Romans, as you'll see, because they put actually scorpions within the legions, we allow some legionary bases to have light artillery experience. So some of them actually do shoot. The slings in the Romans, we treat as part of integral shooter and part of shoot and charge, in that they weren't used in enough density other than the siege type situation that Simon mentions to justify a full shooting capability. If you go to somebody more like the Incas, which we're playing with at the moment with some slightly different interpretations, every single one of them had a sling intended to use them. So a lot of those have um, fighting characteristics, but all shoot with sling. Um, the Aztecs all have what we've classified as dart for their artillery. So we have a, quite a, a flexible way of dealing with all missile weapons, grading them from didn't have enough to use them as a main shooting weapon all the time, so it could be integral shoot to shoot to charge, or we upgrade them and actually give them one of the main four shooting characteristics there, and they're now a genuine missile troop. 
let's move on to the to the next page. And, and these pages, I'm going to build. I'm going to build Rome, Simon's Rome, one by one. Okay, in different eras. So if we go back to the Camelon, Tullian era, uh, sort of eras. First thing, going back to what we've uh, what we have as characteristics, they're not drilled. They're formed. You know, they're not the true full-on professional legionaries of later that could move her all over the place and do everything. They're a little bit more like cities and spearmen in the in the Greek cities and spearmen and Christian Greek hospice. So worth, worth, uh, is, 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 Simon, can I just interrupt very briefly, just to, yeah. to, to make one comment? It's worth re, re, uh, remembering here, which backs up exactly what you're saying about them being formed and not drilled, that until the time of Camillus, these first-class warriors weren't paid when on military duty. So they did it as a duty to their town or city. They, were, they weren't paid at all. Yeah. So they are exactly like the, uh, the city hoplite, who has a responsibility to form an entire time of need and fight for his city but they're not paid full-time professionals working all the time as a, as, as a military entity. So, so they're, they're long spear. They have shield cover because they still had the very large shields and had the capability of working closely together. But in the grading system, there are no superiors allowed in the list at all. So this the main Camelon list and the Tullian lists are more like hoplites in the way you would see them than they are, um, than they are Roman legionaries of the later eras. So you start off, with, but you'll get more of them because they're cheaper in the point system, you're playing a points game, but you start off with a bit less manoeuvrable, long spear-based force. If you can do the next one for me, Rob, and, and we'll move to the next era. So the next era we get to the mid-Republican Romans, so the classic ones of Zama that Simon mentioned earlier. So now they change, they become drilled close. They gain the impact weapon, keep the shield cover. So now they're a different type of troop. They also have the option of melee experts. So they start to become very good with Gladius and capable in a, in a fight. And we also start to introduce some veteran ones from the drilled armies that do particularly well. So you can have up to 16 bases out of a big army, which is possibly half your legions on a, on a classic army, maybe 40% to half of the legions of the era could be upgraded to superior. But we keep the triarii, the third rank, with the long spear. <sighs> Okay, so they have their own individual character because they have those at the front and the triara at the back, but very different to the, to the Camelon. If we do, do the next one, now we're going to get to Caesar and the various uh, pieces around there after the Marian reforms. So they change. We now give them that flexible that I mentioned, drilled flexible, because there's no real reason that they weren't capable of fighting in broken up terrain. They just weren't as powerful as they were blocked together. And in the rules, you'll find you want your legions really blocked together in the open because that's their, where they're at the best. But they can actually spread out if necessary and fight more man to man. They keep all their impact weapon and shield cover. They've now got optional melee expert and orb. And the quality rises. You get up to 24 superiors and eight exceptionals, which represents Caesar's 10th legion in that era. So if you're looking for the powerhouse, hand to hand Roman full of legionaries, this is, this is the era where you, you have that. It's fairly one dimensional but boy, are some of them good. And they can cope with most things. We, we move on to the next one. So we now go to what we term the early, the early imperial era, another 250-ish years. These are, these are now the ones with, the, uh, with the, the, the renowned armor and the rectangular shields, similar at this level, but now they start to get some different things coming in. They start to add integral shooters to the list because at times they did get bulked up with integral bowmen and slingers in, in that sort of period. Um, you get the same 24 superiors and exceptionals, but now you introduce large quantities of auxilia. Now the auxilia themselves became a, a major arm of the Roman legions in their own right, and you would see armies where you would have as many auxilia as you would have legionaries or even more. And you get the extra twist that you can have bolt shooters integral to some legionaries. And the rule system is, is very able to handle mixed bases in their units because all we do is we take one of six bases say and credit it with light artillery experience and suddenly your unit which is a, a a legion has got five legionaries and a ballista and actually and actually shoots at long range with the ballista i mean very very famously actually uh, i think caesar in the in the gallic wars earlier with, the, with his original squadrons, which were not integral, they were set up separately. They got so good at them, they used to target the enemy leaders. 
So if you imagine being, I think that's referred to in one of the historical references that, that, uh, that I wrote. Go on, Simon. It's worth reflecting here as well, by the way, how important the, this artillery was to differentiate the Romans from most of their opponents. Because if you look at the classic Prinky Paint Legion, they had over 50 Scorpios, so the lighter bolt shooter, and then around 10 Ballista, the larger bolt shooter, later Scorpio stone throwers. That's a lot of artillery. And then if you look at the principal areas where the Romans campaigning, let's look at Britain, for example. Uh, when um, Paul Linus defeated Boudicca, at the battle, at the alleged battle of Watling Street, um, he fought that battle in an area where there were a number of Roman logistics bases, which were converted forts from the earlier stop line along what later became the Foss Way. And they'd have been rammed with artillery as well. So it's likely you would have found at certain engagements, so this one in particular, there would have been an exponentially larger number of bolt shooters. And having tried to recreate this twice already ahead of our next two Simon show, and I know we'll talk about this later, uh, the bolt shooters make a really big difference. Yeah, they do. And in the, and in the, uh, um, in the story of that battle, which is probably best told by the man himself there, the, uh, uh, the bolt shooters created mayhem in particular because the chariots were placed at the front. And actually, the uh, artillery in the rules get a boost against chariots. Because you can imagine uh, anything like that hitting any part of a chariot is going to cause chaos. And chaos is exactly what they caused. There were bits of chariots and loose horses and dragging bits of chariots all over the place in the report. To, 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 give, you an ex to give you an example, Simon, when, when I was fighting Alex yesterday trying to recreate the battle, I put Boudicca in charge of units of six light chariots. And uh, I was playing the Britons, I was Boudicca, and Alex was uh, playing Paulinus. And I miss place by about two millimetres the units of chariots which allowed two of Alex's bolt shooters to fire at Boudicca and because uh, the way the dice work you get a bump up to a better quality of dice because they're firing at chariots one chariot got killed in the first volley <laughs> yeah no that's that's the sort of chaos that can that can easily occur so these are these again have got a very different character you see because you'll make more use of auxilia you'll have more artillery in there um, creating the pressure and, and you keep the flexibility of the uh, of the Romans and you can have a very small high quality version of it if you wish. Tom if we flick to the next one. So now let's add the next period of Imperial and another it's actually only 150 years it doesn't quite go to 3407 CE actually I noticed a fun typo there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 I missed that one earlier. So we're starting now into the era when things start to decline a little bit. So you keep basically the same types of le legionaries with the integral shooters, but you, you start to drop back on the numbers of quality, but you have a huge mass of auxilia. And actually the auxilia and legionaries in this period can actually be regraded as short spear with darts. So they become more missile oriented troops. And the short spear, it was actually short spear, javelins, darts, sleeves, whatever you want to name, they, they mixed in there. Um, and it was, uh, a, to a great deal, a, a, an innovation from the east of the empire, coming back into the west of the empire, to be able to pile firepower um, onto people. And, they, and you could have in this, in this version of the army an entire army already that has no pill and no impact weapons at all. It could actually be all short spear darts at this stage and have a very different character. It keeps the bolt shooters integral to the legionaries. So there's five periods already which, you, which are quite different. And what's interesting in the game is you don't need a lot of difference of these for the overall feel of an army to feel radically different, actually. And you'll see that when we describe some battles. One more, Tom, if we can. There's two more to go, I think. I thought uh, Simon uh, Elliott had a question. Okay. I was, I, was, I was going to point out two quick things there, Simon, actually, because um, that uh, entry in particular enables me to sort of reflect on two things about uh, Mortimer McGlorian, which I, I think the, the listeners will like. Firstly, the drilled aspect for the uh, legionaries and the auxiliary in this period, if, the, if they've got darts, really plays in their favour, because clearly what they want to do is to be able to put as much firepower onto their opponents as possible to create a bit of mayhem before they go to hand-to-hand. -hand. Because if uh, I think one of the things we do here is we don't give the legionaries with the dart and the short spear a melee expert, because it makes them too powerful. But the drilled aspect means they can dance backwards. So as the opponent approaches, they can dance backwards and shoot again and dance backwards and shoot again if they've got the cards to do it. And therefore, hopefully, thin down their opponent before they go to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. But the second point is how this helps us explain how Mortimer Glory, more than any rule set I've played, is a community of people. 
because I used to use uh, auxiliary palatina and auxiliary in my late Roman armies, very successfully winning competitions. Uh, for the first couple of years we played, because I, I really used the darts well. Um, and at that time, the darts had a range of three, the same as a foot bow, and they had the same effect as a foot bow as well. They were throwing a white dice. But we realised after a while, especially because I probably was winning too many competitions, that actually that made them too powerful. So listening to the community, uh, what we did was we downgraded the quality of the darts such that it is only a white dice up to two base widths, but for that extra third of a base width, it's a black dice, so it's very difficult to do any damage. Um, and I, I think that shows, as much as anything else, how we're a community and everybody is encouraged to contribute. Tom, there was a question you wanted to raise. I, I'm going to come back to that later if you'll remind me. Maybe you can remember to ask me again about that, Tom, near the end, but I'll not, I'll not do it just yet. No, it wasn't a question for me. I, was just, I, I saw Simon was trying to say something. So. Uh, okay. And well, in that case, I'll add to it now if it's easy. Um, I'm a, the most important thing to me in all of this war gaming is fun and community. Once you've got something that's hysterically good. And when I, uh, when I set up the rules in the early days, I set them up as a listening set. So I said, look, I think these are really good. They're working really well, but I'm all ears. You know, I'll fund doing them myself and I'll find out what you say. And what was fantastic is there were about 500 people who were very vocally involved, feeding back thoughts and ideas. And I got this fantastic team of people to work on the list. So we have this amazing repository of historic information by people who are really good at history because we built 670 different army lists, Mort McGlorium, and they are all free. They're all sitting at the website free. And, and they are without doubt the greatest list effort in the history of ancient warfare. They cover everything. And every single list, I said, let's start from the principle of writing off every received wisdom we've ever heard. And let's go back and ask ourselves, is there any justification for it all? And if there is, we'll keep it in. If there isn't, we'll do something different. And the team have been just amazing. So I think probably the thing that makes me most proud about the rules set is seeing so many, many people enjoying it and interacting. It's, 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 it's become a team effort where I sort of jokingly say I created it, but I see myself more as a facilitator of it than the, <laughs> than the creator of it these days. Which is, uh, which is a nice feeling. I like it. So credit to everybody. And some of the army lists that's right there have been driven by one or two individuals who just happen to know a hell of a lot about the Vietnamese army of... 1217 and chucked all their knowledge in to people who didn't and we just we just toned it and said okay this is how that fits into this system this is how that fits into oh, look at that a fantastic army list for early medieval vietnam fantastic well done thank you so it's been a terrific terrific sort of experience so going back now so we're into the federati era so i'm now in area six now the auxiliary legion is the same whether you like it or not now there's really no no variation you can't uh, see much differentiation between them you get some differentiated quality, which is the Palatina ones that, uh, that Simon Elliott referred to earlier. The, the auxilia are all drilled flexible, so they can all work in and out of terrain. They're all short spear dart. They keep the shield cover. You can have the option of melee expert. You only get up to eight superiors now. So the, the quality of the army is dropping. The volume is growing, the quality is dropping. And you actually have up to 24 Federati infantry, who are the people who've been drawn into Rome, Roman armies, but fighting their own method. And these are tribal flexible short spear devastating charges. So you've kind of added a sort of warband community to a, a Roman army. So you get quite a different feel emerging if you try to command that, then you try and command the all drilled uh, early imperial above. And then if we do the last one, because we have seven different periods in the list, we flick forward one more. Yeah. You should see. So we have the Eastern later Roman Federati, which really is the, uh, uh, the, the end of the Western Roman Empire and the beginning of, of the Byzantine era in the East. Again, they're all, they're all the same. There's no superiors at all in this army, none. Okay, so you're back to where you were with the Camel and you've gone full circle back to average troops only. And you've 24 of these Federati types. And uh, actually, if you look down there, even uh, melee experts disappeared now. So this army is a very different character. It's, it, this is a real mass mix of, of character. And this is the, this is the army that uh, fought Attila and then the Goths in the West uh, during the decline, decline of Rome. And you get quite a lot of these infantry short spear devastating charges. So hopefully that can, that can give you a picture of how by having these, this character built in for different troop types, if you like Romans, 
A, Romans are good. <laughs> they actually are good. They're good armies to field. So uh, there was a recent competition in the UK, the classical period, I think there's 16 armies and there's six Roman armies present. I haven't seen that for a long time, first of all. So people like playing Romans in Meg, which is a good thing, because they were, after all, about the greatest early empire that you had. So if the rule set doesn't encourage people to feel them, it's slightly weird. Okay, so it's good, good that. But the, these different periods, all seven of them, play very, very differently, and they all have their own character and feel. So, yeah, Tom, so I'd like to take a few questions there, if you like, before we talk about a few battles which are all involved in. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Is there anything you've picked up particularly that people would like to ask? Have a breather. Well, Simon, I've, I've got a uh, quite not, not being familiar with the, the rule set. Uh, so uh, is there a, uh, a grouping of periods like we used to have for, uh, you know, the first book and second book and third book? Are, are those 670 different lists all playable against each other? Yeah, that, well, there's... there's uh, two questions in that, so let me take them individually. In terms of how they're clustered, they're clustered into some main eras. So we have the biblical eras, we have the classical era, we have the early medieval era, we have the medieval era, etc. So we have some major blocks, and within each of those, there's a PDF that covers a, a zone because what we felt it was best was to take a geographic area and be able to describe how the armies in that geographic area evolve. So nearly all of these lists, the first six of these, you'll find in classical Italy as a PDF. But the Italy as a PDF also has, if we were right back to the beginning of this presentation, you don't need to, but on the map there, you'd see the Etruscans and the Samnites. Those are also in there. So the history of the classical era Italian armies are all in that one PDF. The last one actually is in the beginning of the Byzantium one, actually, because it's the beginnings of Byzantium. In terms of play, one of the, one of the very important things that we did with, with this is to keep the point system online. And that was something I insisted on a lot as a bit of a statistician and tech person on games. If you take a point system and you have it additive, let me just explain this, it's quite important. So if you say it's 20 points for a legionary, say, and then you say it's an extra five points for them to be superior, and it's an extra five points for them to have melee experts, you guarantee that the combination is a bargain because these two benefits interact on each other. So the minute you take the superior, the melee expert's worth seven, not five. The minute you take the melee expert, it's worth seven, not five. So one of the things you might have observed in the past is whatever rule system you played, if people were playing in competitions, they lean towards superior troops. They lean towards quality troops. That's actually the underlying reason. They're actually heavily loaded troops are always a bargain. So the, the, the system here isn't straightforward addition. It's actually multiplicative, which means we built it online into a really easy to use um, spreadsheet with drop downs. So you build your armies that way. It has all the characters. It take you very little time. If I could share screen, I could pop one up and show you. It takes no time at all. It's on the, it's on the website. But the plus of it is it means the point system is really, really well balanced. So out of those 670 armies, you could go to an open competition and probably play 600 of them and they'll be fine. You'll be perfectly fine. So the beauty of that to me, going back to community, is people, hey, oh, what army should I start with? What's the killer army? I was like, there isn't one, there's no killer army, actually. It's all about how you design it and how you play it. So my recommendation to all of you is find an army that interested you, that you like, you like painting and you like the history of, find it and play it, it'll be fine. It'll do perfectly well if you design it well and you play it well. And it doesn't actually matter what it is. So Simon mentioned earlier that uh, after using darts, they were a bit too powerful and they toned them down uh, you know, after, I guess, the, the, the rule set was already used. So are these points uh, updated up periodically? Are they pretty much set once they're in there? Or are well, it took us three years to optimize it. So they were optimized every year. So we sat down as a team every year, looked at what people were saying, asked their opinions and tweaked rules a bit and points more till we got the balance right. These things are iterative. That's another problem with printing them at day one. If you can get them right, you are beyond a genius because it is impossible. It's guesswork at the beginning. You know, there's no way you can get them right. So once you've locked them into a book, you're stuck with them. So we put them online and took the feedback. So we adjusted the points every year. The, the first set of points wasn't bad, actually. It wasn't a terrible shot. There was nothing stood out as super, super strong. But there were certain weapons and certain troop types that you could see dominated. So I think dart-armed infantry and pikes were very popular in year one. And gradually we've adjusted them, and now you see an even balance. So, um, so yeah, three iterations, and I think we're, we're there. 
there might be one or two tiny tweaks to come, but there'll be very little. And it also keeps it independent <laughs> of the rules. You know, the point system are independent in the rules. So, you know, nothing, nothing will change unless I just decide the samurai I love too much aren't good enough, and then maybe I'll... <laughs> <laughs> that of course is a joke i don't actually do that. Yeah, but, uh, uh, we, uh, i think that's fair to say sam isn't they're very well balanced i mean i have i've played all sorts of strange armies just to try them out and uh, and you can always do well with them you can play incas against romans and if you play the incas well you'll have a lot more incas play the incas well it'll be fine so you know we do a lot of periods that are in period not really because it doesn't it doesn't work it's because um, it's nice to see historical opponents up against each other. So we do a lot of tournaments that way. But my World Championship tournament, which I run every year, is completely open. It's 10,000 points open. Bring whatever you like. Well, I've got some questions about how the uh, army looks arrayed, if you will, uh, how its you know, mana pools and cohorts are, are depicted on the table. But I think those will follow in some of the uh, battle descriptions that are coming probably, up. Yeah. 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 It's probably easier to describe it in the images that are coming, if I may, because I've got some photos of, of games <laughs> and it's easy to describe that way. All right. Shall we go on to Magnesia then? Yes. OK. So we thought we, as the two Simon show, what we decided to do is to take a historical battle we would present um, the history of it and the build-up and some of the questions about it, and then we'd refight it a couple of times. So Simon refights it in Kent, and I refight it in Cape Town, and then some other people have a go, and we see where we go. So we've got Roman armies from a few different uh, versions of those shows, and this one, Magnesia, you'll find on YouTube twice. We actually played an interesting what-if as well. So uh, the, the Romans here are that mid-Republican Roman, so I'm not going to loiter on it, but this is what an army list looks like. And if you look down here, you'll see this, this Roman Latin legion here. You'll see there's a Hastati Principi. This is Impacto, the small version of the game. It's the version I use. So there's a unit in inverted commas of two of each of those. And there's a single base unit of Triari sitting behind. So this would be set up as four bases, two by two, with a single Triari at the back representing one legion in this more micro version of the game. And remember, these few bases, 20 bases, are representing 20,000. Men. So one of the classic questions of the Romans and the manipulative system is, um, do you want to see it individually? You only really will see that, would see that, if you wanted to focus down on a very small battle, very small part of a battle. Um, and actually your troops, all of us are war gamers with our figures on the bases. <clears throat> we also need to remember that if we have a base on the table, the width is the right, but all the figures are in the front five millimeter, all the real people. So it's, uh, they're, they're very deep compared to the real formations. So that's how it's sort of set up. Each of those legions, you see Legion 1, Roman Legion 1, Roman Legion 2, the hostile tech, and, the, and you get the V-lights in this particular area, so you get the light infantry involved there. The next page, you'll see a picky of the Battle of Magnesia played in, in Pacta, so I can explain a Pacta game. And this one's done in six millimeter, using my six millimeter collection. Okay? So the table for a Pacto game in, with 50 millimeter baiting is just a three foot by two foot play mat. So it's a, it's a perfect sort of tabletop coffee table, almost dining table game. Um, we've got the battlefield here with the, Ro the Romans are on the, on the top. Um, the, uh, in the center are legionaries. So you can see in the, actual, in the actual battle here, if you look top right, best place to look, the five bases in a general up there. The four facing south are the Histarti and the Principes. And the one that's turned to the right and is moving off to the right to protect the rear is the Triari from that legion. So that's a perfect example of a mid-Republican legion set up as it would be and doing what it does. The Triari are being used as a backup to encourage the front or to provide protection if anything goes wrong. And in this battle, they managed to block the flank for a while and buy some time. Down the bottom, you've got what was famous about Magnesia, which is this very strange deployment of pike, elephant, pike, pike, elephant, pike, pike. So you see the pike ones are three deep. So in Pacto, a pike is a file of three deep. Uh, elephants are a single base. And that was quite a brittle formation. And actually, as we refought this battle, we found that came up repeatedly as a brittle formation. And on the top right, you've got uh, Eumenes. When these, these figures up there are hoplites. So there's four bases of hoplites. And they have to be two deep to have the depth to claim their factors. In the same way as the pikes have to be three deep to get full factors. And on the right at the bottom is Antiochus's heavy cavalry attack. And this battle, I think, has been fought nine times now in total, in different versions. Simon fought it in the bigger scale, uh, and the Romans usually win. I think it's 7-2 to Rome in the, in the total fight. They did, of course, win. 
and they usually win because the leaders in the middle break the elephants and cause mayhem in the center. We refought an alternative version where we grouped all the elephants together and all the pikes together and, and Antiochus did a bit better actually won one of those two. But in every game we have had the same historical result on the right as you look at it which is Antiochus's power command has managed to break the Allied Legion on the flank and crash into the camp. It just has never returned in time to change the overall effect of the of the game. So it's been fascinating. It's been a very, it was a very historical result in our uh, refact sessions and with the people who played it thereafter, Sam. Absolutely, yeah. One of the interesting things to reflect there about um, uh, the flexibility of Mortimer McLaurin is, is the unit types as well. So we have two principal unit types, which Simon will talk about. We have a, a tactical unit group, a tug, which is your line of battle troop. And then we have a skirmish unit group, a sug, which is a unit of skirmishers one of the things we can do with tugs is we can make them combine units so we can have a base unit type base troop type but then add something different and for my magna version Ma uh, maximus version of uh, magnesia to recreate this really odd deployment uh, where antiochus put uh, elephants two elephants between each unit of pike uh, i created to test it and it really actually worked in this one battle alone, uh, a unique kind of tug, which was a unit of pike with an attached elephant. So instead of having just eight pike, you had eight pike and one elephant. Now, what that meant was the elephant has a, a characteristic at impact called shatter. And if the dice go right, it gives a boost of a factor of two to the uh, files next to it. So that meant that the file next to it with the pikes was exponentially better off if the elephant got the shatter but because the elephant was only one figure if it died it automatically gave an overlap in melee to the unit fighting the pikeman so it was either a big win or a big loss and it really helped recreate the flavor of the battle and that's down to the flexibility of the rules all right i've got uh, two questions about the image and you probably mentioned it but it'd be worthwhile to say to you so which size force are we looking here in terms of the the levels of play uh, in, in terms of bases, this is the size of the army you would get out of the Pacto boxes. So this is the Pacto game, which is typically 20 to 30 bases a side. And uh, okay, what, so are the, what are the circles we see? Uh, I was, just, I was just hoping someone would mention that, yes. So, so the system is run using colours. People describe this as a card-based system. It isn't card-based, actually. It's colour-based. You can use anything you like to drive the color system. It's just you have to have a way of randomly drawing out a set of colors because the colors are what give you your options. So these discs are the command discs. And I think you might have a video, actually, that we sent you, Tom, if you can boot it up, which is actually the, the command disc from the new PSC tag circulating. And I can talk a little bit about the colors in the game. So these are actually the command chips for each of the commanders on the table, the ones you can see, and they're designed in color to blend into the tabletop so that they don't make the game look out of place. They, they, they blend in really well. These are my personal ones that blend in with MDF. I see a funny story, actually, I, I created the rules. I'm one, I haven't got a set yet. <laughs> I live in South Africa, <laughs> Cape Town, and with COVID, it's been very difficult to get anything through customs. So uh, despite many hundreds of people now having them, and, uh, and some of you in the US now starting to get them, I actually haven't got a set of my own rules yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can't play with the actual master new versions. Did you find that, Tom? Uh, no, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull that up with the... Uh... Uh, it's it's kind of in different little bits. I think the video. Don't worry. There was a. It's a spinning. It's a spinning disc. Everybody. So, um, the these each of these discs on the back has a color. So I'll explain the basic system of Meg for you now. There are five colors. They they go black, white, so the two neutrals, green, yellow, red. Okay. And essentially, what you've got is when you're moving, a red disc is the best that will allow you to do an awful lot more than the black disc. So if you are drilled Romans, you will find that you can wheel with a green disc, for instance. But if you are tribal Gauls, you can only wheel with a yellow. And you will draw a set of these out between two and five for each general. So you'll have a hand of colors and you spend the colors to make the moves and you do it interactively between the two players. So it's not I move everything, you move everything. It's I take an action, you take an action, I take an action, you take an action. So it's quite gripping. And it also reflects, therefore, that people could counter what other people were doing somewhat and would be reacting. So the color system is what drives it all. 
And, and if you're trying to do something complicated, you'll find you'll need a red. So if you wanted to uh, take some um, tribal troops and make them do a double wheel, so wheel one way, a wheel back in one move, that would be a red. The Romans, meanwhile, could do lots of things with greens. So they could do advance and shifts with a green. So it brings it, because we've got three types, the formed in the middle, there's a lot of variation in what you can do with the troops. The game moves very, very fast. This is, a, this is a picture of the battle after turn one, okay? Everything moves quickly. So the cavalry on the right have moved from down here all the way, all the way up there in, in one turn and then were advanced upon by the opposing infantry who did a bit of reacting. So the, the game moves quickly. So usually in turn two, not many minutes in, you'll have your first sh shooting and by turn three, you'll have your first combat. So what I've done in the game is I've compressed all the preamble into a shorter period of time by doing that. So it's a, it's a fast moving game, but the colors are the key, the colors drive it. You then have dice exactly the same five colors. You have a, a, a red down to a black and you use these to resolve combat and shooting. It takes a lot of pain out. And the better you are, the better the dice you get to roll. You do it file by file. And a, a black dice can't do a lot. It's got four blanks. It's got a, a wound marker on it, which does half a base damage. And it's got an S, which is special effects of slow. The red one at the other extreme has got two skills, which directly kill a base, three wounds, which do half a base, and an S, so you can't miss, basically. So the whole system is built around those colors. So uh, there's plenty of videos actually where you can see it, or you can read a, uh, an overview of it on the website, rather than me going through all of it here. But I'm happy to take questions from anybody at the end if you want me to explain a few little bits. Uh, um, you've got one uh, about uh, from uh, Steve Clark asking you to explain the color percentage. Uh, okay, yeah, the color percentages, yeah, they're really important. I should say that. So the set is 50, so you need 50 color devices, um, and there are only six in that 50 that are red. Okay? There are eight that are black, there are 10 that are yellow, there are 12 that are white, 14 that are green. So it's got a distribution bias towards the middle. So if you have a big tribal army of ancient Gauls who need lots of reds and yellows to do things, you can find yourself a little strapped to do anything clever. And if you're playing against somebody with high quality drilled Romans, they'll find that whites and greens will get them lots of things happening. Whereas whites and greens for you, that'll mean walk ahead. That's about it. You won't be able slowly. to do Slowly, yeah. <laughs> slowly. Slowly, yes, because the only things you'll be able to do, you'll only be able to do that, that and, and march ahead. So it provides all of the friction in the game for different troop types and different command structures. The other twist to add is it's not random. So in a lot of games, you roll a dice for each commander and you could get, say, three ones. I used to play DBM a lot. So you, the curse of the four ones with a professional general. You won't get that in this. It's, it's not as brutal because you choose your generals. So if you were to choose all mediocre generals and only have two discs per general, you might have that happen, but it's your own fault because you chose it. So you had an option to do it. And there are only eight blacks in the, in the pack, so you'd have to get all eight. And the odds of that is well over a million to one. So you'd have to play a while for it to happen. Um, so, it, so the sort of command friction you have depends on how you structure your army, how you structure your generals. So there's a lot of interesting choice in army design where you don't just pick your troops and pick your generals. You want to pick your, your tugs and sugs, your, your unit groupings and your generals with a view to how you want them to operate and what flexibility you want to have. So there's a fair bit you can have as fun thinking about how to design your army to get that to work, work well. Shall we move on in history to a slightly different era and some bigger figures? Then we can at least maybe see figures rather than little, little dots, but it just proves it looks nice at six mil. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the Romans at, at Sabis, and I'll, I'll pass on to Simon to talk about the actual battle, but, uh, but it's, I'll just talk about the army. This is Caesar. Uh, and his later Republic army. So you see the army list looks completely different to the one you had before. There's not all these multiple um, types of troops within a legion. We now have eight legions represented each by a tactical unit group of six bases. And I'm gonna use this moment to say what a tug and a sug is, because it's quite precious to me, but it's a little bit theoretical, but it does, it does make a difference. If you use the word unit, it's fine. It doesn't bother me at all. But the problem with the word unit is it means a different thing to every person. And actually, um, a lot of troops, if they were thinking of a unit, like in Alexander's army, they'd think which, which particular 
group of 256 pike they were associated with or which 100 Romans they were associated with. If you look at how battles were fought top down, you have your senior commander and you have three or four commanders commanding wings and centers and such things. And, and under them, you have more generals, but junior generals. And each of those generals has a cluster of units and they're working as his command. We don't want to represent them individually. We're playing the big guys. So we term it a tactical unit group because it's all the units clustered under that one, one player. In this case, it's the legate for each of these legions who's going to be in charge of each of these legions who's all got all the different maniples of the legions and that's what we term a tactical unit group it's a group of units that for this battle will be operating tactically together they wouldn't be roaming off all over the place and they would be under a commander if you're fighting the ancient britons it's probably a tribe you know it'll be a tribe of warriors with their with their actual leader that will be a tactical unit group and, and, the, and the SUG is just the same thing for skirmishes. It's a mass of skirmishes bolted together for the sake of the game. So the battle will look top down. And most battles do, if you read and look at them and look at maps of them, look, at, look like 10 to 20 blocks of troops. So 10 to 20 junior generals with the troops clustered together and those themselves allocated to the big generals, the big four, who are the ones who are really running the battle. And they're the big four are the ones we are playing. So we don't represent the ones below. The tug effectively does represent them. That's, that's what it is. If you want to add a fancy figure to the, to, the, uh, to the unit to represent the legate, all the better. It would look beautiful. But we don't represent them on their own. And that's what a tug and a sug is. People often laugh at me for the terms. I tried to find something that would work. Hey, it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but I didn't want to use unit because for some people, unit means allegiance. For some unit means a maniple. For some unit means an ala. It's got so many different connotations that it doesn't really work. We need something more specific to define the concept. So a meg battle look top down will be 10 to 20 blocks is what you're going to be managing. And those blocks will, broadly speaking, stick together uh, and do their moves as, as, as big blocks. So here you go. So this is classic Roman, loads of legionaries, not many cavalry, not much else. <laughs> Simon, do you want to talk briefly at the battle and the sort of outcomes off the next page? And you'll yeah, go, go, the go, battle go. played in uh, Maximus. This is the big yep. version of the game. Yeah. So can we move on to the next page? Yeah, move on. Perfect. Did you see it? It was fought in the dark. No. <laughs> is that good? It would blank for me. I don't see it. So <laughs> are you seeing it? <laughs> no, it's blank for me. No, nope. it should be a photograph. Let's see. Oh, that's not good. Maybe you have to go up further to get it totally off screen before it comes up. Let me uh, go to the file. Sorry about that. It's okay. Go. Well, while, while we're looking, what I'll do, Simon, is I'll just describe the context of the battle. It's a very interesting battle to, to look at. This is uh, Caesar in his second year campaigning in his conquest of Gaul, this sanguineous conquest of Gaul, where he later brags that uh, kills a million Gauls and captures a million Gauls and enslaves them. And in his second year of campaigning, he goes against his most difficult opponent, who are the Belge, uh, in the region of sort of uh, the modern Low Countries. And what he does is um, marches all of his legions available into the heartland of the Belge, where there's a tribe called the Nervi, who he chooses to be his principal target. And uh, they almost ambush him. So this is Caesar responding to uh, a potential ambush. And it's a really, really hard fought battle where Caesar has to personally intervene two or three times leading his troops. And we re recreate this in Mortimer Glorian by having uh, the, the leader choosing to fight in a combat, which puts him at risk. And Caesar himself is at risk when he engages three times, rallying troops, fighting troops, etc. And ultimately he proves victorious. Uh, as he does most of the time when he's uh, in his conquest of Gaul. Um, so it's a really interesting battle to, to refight because we have here uh, the most talented general of the era, probably, um, responding to uh, a deadly potential trap and coming through and ultimately winning. Although my personal recreation, if you remember, Simon, Caesar sadly didn't win, he lost. And the last image we had on my deck was of him running back to Rome on his horse alone. I do remember that, yes. And actually, in uh, in one of my refights, I got him killed. So, I didn't want to remember. <laughs> so, actually, the saddest one is very interesting because of, 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 of all these battles. It's the one that's come out in the reenactments as the most even, I would say. I think it's probably running at only something like 
one ahead for the Romans, 5-4. I know Lee Sanders played a couple of them, one each. I've seen it won twice by the Gauls and, and twice by the Romans. So it's actually a near-run thing. Caesar's genius survived a near-run thing, which he had a habit of doing, actually. He survived this one with the, uh, um, the, the Romans sort of caught, caught unawares with the, some of the troops without their armour on and unprotected. Um, and he survived one that we're going to do later, which is one of my favourite battles, which is Respina, where he was surrounded by a bunch of Pompeian Numidians when he went out foraging and uh, made it back without any problem feeding his army because he'd managed to leave half of them. <laughs> so he solved the food problem in a slightly different way. So uh, he, he's wriggled his way out quite often. Tom, have you had any luck? Because if not, I've yeah. loaded up here no. and I've changed my settings. It's possible I could share screens and do it here. No, I think we're uh, back on. I just had to re-download it. Okay. There you oh, go. There, there, there we go. There you go. This is Simon's. This is Simon's Maximus battle in its relatively early stages. Uh, so, Simon, you can talk through a few of the sugs and tugs on there and what's going on. I think it's fairly late stage, actually, Simon. <laughs> I think, I think, I think what you've got there is the uh, the Roman oh, right. centre and the Roman right. So, so the Romans are at the top of the screen. The Roman centre and the Roman right have already broken. The Gauls are now engaging the poor quality reserve legions, which are the ones in the blue top left. Uh, the Roman uh, Numidian cavalry there, extreme top left, are getting ready to screen the Romans' retreat. And at this point, I think Caesar's already off screen. <laughs> Is he? Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> oh, okay. And on the so, right hand side of the picture, we've got the higher quality legion. So you've got the 10th and the 9th, I think, over that side, haven't we? That's right. Just holding on, but not, yeah, not, not, on. Enough, not, not enough to convince Caesar it was a good idea to stay. <laughs> yeah. So on the day in this battle, the, uh, the Romans were defeated and the, uh, the, the nervy won and sacked the Roman camp. So, uh, <laughs> so that, was a, that was a victory for them. My two games on the day in Pacto, different sized game uh it's it's on the youtube channels you can watch it on there the romans managed to just win those but they were really close battles and actually one of the things you'll find if you start playing meg it, it's got a certain fun factor because you don't find many battles are easy wins for either side there's there's very few bloodless battles in meg i mean you don't end up with your army looking like it's been untouched with hardly any losses you'll you'll all end up with a reasonable pile of casualties even if you've won and the scoring system is designed to encourage positive play so you can't sit there and work out how to draw. You actually have to sit there and work out how to win, which is one of the nice things that we found in, uh, in playing it in, uh, in tournament play. Well, well it's, it's worth pointing out, it's, Simon, it's worth pointing out there as well, one of the joys of playing with Mortimer Glorium is the fact that you're never inactive as a player. So often you get a rule set where you move everything for half an hour and your opponent twiddles his thumbs, goes and has coffee or whatever, and then he moves everything and you twiddle your thumbs. Here, we move unit, you, I move a unit, you move a unit, I move a unit, you move a unit, I move a unit, until the turn's over. So you're always in play. And from a historian's perspective, it's fantastic because what it allows you to do is really feel empathically the ebb and flow of battle. And actually, just to add to that, the, the moving unit, actually, most of the movement early in the game, there's another interesting character, are, are are block moves, as we call them, where a general can move two, three, four, five, six, five, up to five at once of the main bodies. So Caesar is quite capable of moving five legions himself and triggering five legions to move as, a, as an enormous block. So the early parts of the battle, which feels right, is very big blocks. And then in the middle of the battle, you get the engagement. And in the late battle, it starts to fall into chaos. And you'll start to see more individual units moving of their own accord, and you're having to do rather more uh, less organized things, which is exactly what an ancient battle seems to feel like if you read any history of an ancient battle. You know, it's quite orderly at the beginning and it's big sweeping moves and then it's chaos, which is probably true of battles all through history, probably. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's got an interesting characteristic that will, that will keep that feeling alive. But people have joked that, the, that uh, one of the challenges they find my, finding Meg is, is finding how to have a loo break, because in, in a lot of other rules, you can take a loo while the other guy's moving. But this, these, it can be quite different. I've seen people hanging on going, I think I can make it to the end of time. <laughs> end of time, I think I can. And, you know, would you like a drink? No, no. <laughs> so we've had, a bit, we've had a bit of that. But it, it does definitely keep you engaged. It's a very different type of game to a game where the opponent moves the whole army and you move your whole army. It's, it's got a much more interactive feel. 
let's go on to another piece. So that's a Maximus game. So you can see, actually, just, just hold it a sec, Top. Uh, don't worry. It's okay. You saw the size of some of them. So let's, oh, you pulled it back. Great. So just, just to clarify, so, these are, so that's a tug. So if you look at the top right, those six cavalry, that's a tactical unit group of cavalry under a single junior general. It, it's probably in reality, given we've got all of the, I think nearly all the Roman cavalry group there and lots of legions, it's probably a dozen hour of, of cavalry all clustered together under one general. So uh, each base of those is probably represented two Arla, which is the way the Romans sort of their lower level cavalry units. The legions on the top, if you look on the top left, uh, those are going to be probably in eights, I suspect. So Simon Elliott, nod at me if I've got that correct. I think they were in eights, weren't they? Spot yeah. on. Yeah, so these were eights. So if you look up there now, if you were to count those bases, I think you'll, you'll get to a total of something like 12. Maybe 10, actually. 11. I think it's 11, 10 or 11. So they've lost quite a lot of bases already and they're on the brink of going. And every tug breaks when it goes beyond half losses and every sug when it goes beyond the third losses. So gradually you'll get this cataclysmic decline as these things break and sweep stuff away and can cause neighbours to run. So these ones on the, um, on the left, the Romans are quite near to go but also the, the Gallic cavalry are quite near to breaking. And down the bottom left, you've got an example of the largest size of skirmish sug of nine bases. And they're three, they're three deep, representing on the table that to fire effectively skirmishes took up a lot of space. Because rather than what I described the other bases, the Roman legion would be clustered in the front five millimetres. The skirmishes are the opposite. They'd be spread out quite deep because they didn't generally stand and fire. They ran forward, shot through whatever they did and fell back. And it, it was yeah. constant, constant, constant rotation of people doing these sort of things. So actually, they took up a reasonable amount of depth, a skirmish army. They had quite a lot of swarm effects compared to the units that were forced close together. So a swarm of skirmishes is probably twice as deep as a pike phalanx. Yeah, yeah, think of uh, in terms of like clouds of skirmishers. Yeah, think of them as clouds. So in the big game, they're three deep to full effect. So you really do see clouds, as you say. Use a Parthian army, you'll see a hell of a cloud of light horse. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's press on to another one. Keeping going through history, now we're going to go into the early Imperial Roman army and the, uh, the battle supposedly near Watling Street, which is our next show. Um, and we've got a, a different type of army again. If you look at this one, this is my, this is my pacto list. It is tiny. This is absolutely tiny. This is a grand total of 14 bases of rock-hard, super-solid Romans. Right? That's all it is, 14 bases. Uh, there, were, there were two legions there, the 14th and the 20th, both of which were very experienced. So they're all classified as superior. They're fully loaded with bits and pieces and they have the art integral artillery with them. And with what Simon said about raiding the local, uh, uh, the local camps and pulling all the artillery out. So they've got artillery as well. They've got some auxiliary. They've got some heavy cavalry. They're all melee experts. Um, it's, it's a hard as nails little army just under the 3,000 point total, which is the total you'll get out of a Pacto box set. So a very different type of, uh, type, of, type of force. Super small, super powerful. If we flick to the next page, you'll see in Pacto, it, it's up against 64 bases of ancient Britons. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so this is the Pacto version. 14 bases of Romans on the left, 64 bases of ancient Britons sitting there in the, in, in the, in the centre. So we've only refought this a couple of times. Simon's done it once in Maximus, where it looks even more amazing, just masses and masses of figures. I've fought it now twice in this. And uh, the real battle, what happened is they swept forward a, a, in a mass up a valley. And the chariots went in first and the artillery caused them chaos. And the front lines of the Britons, which are reasonably good. In my version, there's two superiors in there and all average. So they've got a reasonable wave. They get broken by the Romans and they break back and they flow through the remainder and they basically call the whole army to collapse and rout and it was a slaughter. And thus far, despite it being 14 bases to 64, it's 2 0 to the Romans in my refight. Big stuff. Hmm? And it's 1 0 in Simon's refight. And actually, it's very interesting that the system can handle perfectly accurately fighting a battle that disparate where the quality has managed to compensate for the, for the quantity. So again, these are these 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 the tugs in this. They're just two bases. It's a single file. So two Romans. If you start at the top, you'll see a cavalry, single-based one. 
uh, two auxiliary with some barricades, and then you've got two legionaries. And the next one is actually two legionaries, but the rear one has got an artillery piece. So I use an artillery piece and replace it with a legionary later, etc. And the uh, the the, uh, the mass down there are two bases each of the individual uh, tugs of, uh, of ancient Britons. So in tug numbers, it's uh, it's eight Roman ones. The army breaks on four versus twenty-seven ancient Britain ones. The army breaks on fourteen. Wow. And uh, this battlefield size, uh, we haven't talked much about the size of the table. This is the, the smaller three foot by uh, two foot two size foot. now. This is the three foot by two foot version. Yeah. And the one Simon had before for Sabis was the six by four Maximus version. Yeah. So, uh, so the three versions for 50 mil, we tend to play on a three by two or four by three or a six by four for the, for the different sizes. Good. So and six by four is the, the maximum. Is different. The 28 mil, we tend to use six by four magna for the middle one. And if you've got a table tennis table size, then it's fantastic for 28 mil. Or for group gatherings. I mean, here in Cape Town, I've met a lovely group of people here. Their particular love is fighting giant battles, which is great. So we do huge reenactments or fictitious games with 12 players, usually on a, uh, a 12 by six or an 18 by six and in 28 mil so they're absolute hoop so we've done a sort of can i type one we've done a medieval one based around castle tiberius and we're about to put my 28 mil war of the roses english on the table once we can get through the covid crisis so it's, it's going to be a hoot excellent and the last battle and then we'll just uh, we'll just throw a bit of news for the future and so now we're going into the decline of rome so this is catalonia plains or what for many years was called the battle of shallon this is Attila against Aetius. It's the first one we actually did. And again, if you look at the armies here, completely different. In fact, you don't see the word Roman very much in the Roman army at all. If you look down the list of troops, you actually see it um, you actually twice if we were to put it in front of Auxilia Palatina. There's, there's not many that are full on Romans in this. So you've got the Auxilia Palatina and the Roman equities as cavalry and the Bucalari where he's cavalry as well. Uh, literally, I learned from Richard Jeffrey Cook recently, Bukalara means biscuit eaters. So they, they got the best of the food. So cookie, the cookie men. So they're, they're the top three. But below that, you get Roman style troops, but actually Federati troops. So these are Gallic, Limitantes. Uh, Simon mentioned the word earlier, the Limitantes are the garrison troops, the ones that would, will be on defensive duty on the borders. Uh, and the, comita, uh, the Comitantes are one notch up from that. The slightly better ones. So we've got some interesting things going out. So the Limitantes ones we've got classified as combat shots, but they still all have shield cover and darts. So these are the Shiti type Romans, and they're up against an army of Huns plus basically six onwards. So both sides had lots of allies: Goths, Visigoths, Gepids, Franks, Burgundians. I mean, we're now talking a whole hodgepodge of an army. It doesn't look anything like a Roman army from Caesar's era. He would have looked at it probably in disgust, thinking, what's all this, what's all this rabble doing in my army? He's spinning in his grave. So it makes for a very different feel of a game. And if you flick on down, we can talk the refight of this one. Again, I've, I've started with a Pacto version. I can, we can boot up some pictures of some bigger ones. But again, this plays beautifully on a three by two. Uh, the Romans are at the bottom. Aetius with his actual Romans are on the left. The Huns are in the centre with some, with some subject allies. Um, if you can look carefully, you can probably see that the cavalry in the middle have got two to a base at the front and three to a base at the back. That's how we represent flexibles. We give them two different sizes of bases. You put the skirmisher at the back, they're in skirmish form. They can flick in the game and put the heavy cavalry base at the front and now they're in loose order. So the, the Huns here are all set up initially to be very fast moving skirmisher shooty types and will reform later. And you've got the Visigoths on the hill on the right. I think we've played this one nine times and the Huns have only won one. So it's been very historical, but it's also been very historical in, the, in what's happened. In the main, the Visigoth right flank wins and drives the Huns back towards their camp. They, the Huns do well, they are quite successful but they have to fall back under threat from their flank on the right. And the Romans actually typically do fairly well. And that's because they're facing a lot of shooters and their shield cover darts makes them as dangerous to the Huns as the Huns are to them. Because they can actually, they can actually shoot back and they can actually protect themselves fairly well. So the Romans tend to stand up reasonably well in the game. So the Rome tends to slowly win the left. The Huns tend to win the center 
but not quick enough to cope with the Visigoths winning the right and turning into the flank. And I think seven of our nine games have been that kind of outcome, and that's actually the historical result of the battles. And I would add that in none of these, is there any, are, are there any special rules added? We've played around with the odd bit, but there are none. I mean, the, the rules as they are represent the games perfectly well. This battle played in Maximus, of course, looks completely different because every two of those cavalry you see on there becomes six. So the whole thing booms out into a much bigger game. Every pair of Romans becomes six. Every pair of the barbarian foot becomes six. So this, this table, which is currently about 25 bases a side, would be more like 75 bases a side on a six by four and, and look very different. But you'll find the feel of the game is actually rather similar between the Pacto and the Maximus. It genuinely is a sort of miniaturized version of the same game. They're pretty much all the same moves and all the same characters. It's just a little more brutal than the, than the bigger game, which has a buffer effect of, of more. And in this so, layout, we, uh, we see a, uh, it looks like, like a, a, a camp or fortification. Is that uh, normal for all forces or is that unique to this scenario? Now, every, every, army, every army has a camp, except we don't insist on one impact. We, we leave them off in Pacta. This is put on because it played a big role in the game, but only in the sense that artillery tied to it. It didn't play any factor on that. But the Magna and Maximus armies all have a camp, which we do as a diorama. Um, it's usually three bases by two bases. We can have a bit of fun putting together something interesting that looks, looks nice. Um, there's been some very nice ones on Facebook recently um, that I've seen. So protecting your camp is quite important in those games. Um, if you lose a camp, then it, it, at the end of the turn in which you lose it, it can affect the, the troops in every single command. There's, the morale in Meg is done through what's called the killer base test. So you don't rule a morale test for your troops. Your opponent rolls a killer base test on all their units when there's a chance they would suffer for morale reasons. If you lose your camp, they get to roll one against every single one in your army. So if you're a little bit brittle and things have suffered some damage, the whole thing can fall apart if you lose your camp at that point. Which again, is quite realistic. If you lose your camp and you're winning really well in the rest of the battle and your troops are in really tough shape, you'll suffer some damage but get away with it. So you don't want to go losing your camp in Beg if you can avoid it. It can be quite messy. We also, by the way, have very different types of camps. In the same theme of the character of the armies, we have uh, the standard camp, which is poor and fights without any barricades. It can be graded with a garrison to average or superior. It can be a fortified camp. It can be a flexible camp, which means it's fortified when you're fighting in your own home territory, but not when you're away. Basically means using towns and villages. And a few armies have what's called a no camp option, which is fairly expensive. You have to pay for that, but you literally have no camp at all on the table. So foraging Mongols, for instance, can take a no camp option. Then the nomadic types pay for that and not have anything to defend. And that gives them the freedom to, to roam around. So again, there's a another massive variation. So the very best camps in existence are the very best Roman ones. They'd be upgraded to superior and fortified, and they are pretty much untakeable at that point. So you can have one that's, that's, that's very, very tough. Hopefully those four army lists and battles give a bit more feel to why the armies feel so different on the table. These four games, the Romans in these four armies just feel totally different. I mean, you have to play them in very different ways. Very cool. Do you want to roll that on, Tom, and we'll just we'll cover off a few things. They just open it up for discussion and questions. Um, just coming back to the uh, the ultracast figures, um, there are now five five out for the uh, for the Roman era plus the Sassanids. So there are late Imperial, Hunnic, and Gothic. All will give you a basic army and released only on the thirty first of July for sale. So two days ago, early Imperial, Roman, and Gallic. What we do with these, what they do with these figures, it's a brilliant technology because we can make really high quality molds from metal masters. So the ones on the, on the right have all used Lokio, which is some really lovely designs for the figures and why they look so special with the late Romans. And those are the plastic figures. The ones on the left are the Corvus belly ones, which have been much loved over the years and been off the market for a while. So I'm sure a lot of people will like to see those back in existence. And if you roll one more forward, I've taken a bit of a punt on Simon and I's behalf on this, but uh, come and join in the fun. Um, there's, there's a couple of things you can do. You can join in with our monthly webinars. We're going to do one a month. We've done Sabes, Catalonia, Magnesia. We've done Canai. Canai played out very, very interestingly. The uh, Carthaginians, I think, won every single game except one 
of the main battle and then I did an alternative deployment for the Romans which they probably couldn't do because of the consular system that made them disagree with each other as commanders and the Romans did rather better. We've got Watling Street coming up on August the 2nd and then we're going to do Ruspina, the one I mentioned earlier with Caesar surrounded by the Numidians and, uh, and I've got Carai and Pharsalus on my list, Simon might have a few more and then we're actually going to carry on it beyond Rome and start doing some others, so Manzikart and Hidaspi. So we're going to keep this rolling, actually, because people have enjoyed it. We do them live as webinars. Come and join in there. You can ask questions just like you can here um, through, through the moderators and join in the fun, and we record them all and put them all up on YouTube. And then the other thing that's going on is, given we can't have real competitions with any great gatherings, we're doing something called the Global Megfest or Megathon on August 29th, where we're doing uh, mini competitions all around the world, gatherings of four to six people, the only thing you need to do is have three scores per person against a different player and you can be face to face or remote and already we've got two confirmed for the UK, Belgium looks likely, France looks likely, Greece looks likely, Australia, the USA is one in Portland, Poland are doing one and Thailand are doing one and I'm doing one here in Cape Town with six people here at my house. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have uh, 10 countries and lots of players playing the game all at the same time on August 29th, feeding a bunch of photographs and, uh, and results in for 10 prizes that we have. Five for doing well in the game and five for having beautiful figures and terrain and such things. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, and there's no need to be an expert. It's quick to learn. Um, one last thing I would say about the rules is we have had two people turn up at major competitions to, to play in the competitions never having played once. They turned up in the morning, they had one practice game with a player, they grappled through game one with a bit of help, by game two they got the hang of it enough they were playing fine, and by game five they started to get hang of the army and was thinking more about what to do with it rather than the mechanics. So one of the beauties is this game is really quick and easy to learn, it's, uh, it's not that easy to master and get completely right, but it's very easy to get going and have fun with. So just come and join the fun, it's a great community, very friendly people. And uh, we, we look forward to getting a lot more people playing around the world and getting a lot more people playing it in the USA. Um, having done this webinar, I hope will help. And we will be at Historicon next year with some demo games. And the materials I know have, I just checked actually, they have certainly landed. So On Military Matters and Noble Knight are the two main stockists at the moment in the US. So if you check them out, they've either got it live now or live imminently. So you, you can get them locally anytime you need very good i really like your idea of the uh, global megathon uh, given what's going on in the world right now a way to get players cooperating and, and participating at the same time all across the globe a great idea thank you yeah I, one of the nice things about the game is it's not terribly millimetric so we're finding a lot of people are enjoying playing remote games through whatsapp or zoom and if you set a game up because it's more a war game than it is a technical minute eye thing, telling somebody, look, I want, I want those Roman cavalry to move around and sit on the top of that hill so they can charge downhill is sufficient instruction and your, your friends can move them and you can have a very good game. So I play typically a, a remote game once a week. I think, uh, I think Simon, he's played a lot more than that, actually. He's been playing two or three a week, I think. Have you tried a tabletop simulator for it yet? Uh, yeah, we've had... Um, there's four people around the world building the materials into Tabletop Simulator. And people have also been using Universal Battles, UBS2, okay. and they've built things into that. So both of those, yeah, both of those are live with bits and pieces going on and people being able to play the game. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nice to see that people have managed to keep enjoying playing and having that social contact at the time when we're really not allowed to get together, which is very difficult for us all, isn't it? When we're used to playing face-to-face -face games a lot. It's a very strange feeling not to be able to do it. It certainly takes its toll a little bit without some things to keep us going. So I'm uh, certainly delighted to hope these things help. Well, if uh, any of the audience out there uh, has any questions, if you want to pop them in the chat box, it would be a good time for us to address them. We've got a, a little bit of time left. If you have anything uh, still outstanding that you'd like to hear about, and while they're doing that, uh, if anybody's uh, given time to type, type in, I'll say that uh, I, uh, I have a rule where I do not start a new, any, any more than one new game system per year. <laughs> I try to keep myself kind of limited. So this, this is definitely my 2020 new game system. Welcome, brother. Yeah, Welcome. I'll be getting a hold of uh, Noble Knight, I guess, and uh, seeing how quick they can get a set out to me. Because uh, I've, I've got my Republican Romans, 
and I have my own um, Gauls and Spaniards, which can fight with them or against them. So I guess at the impact uh, or the pac pacto level, I could probably pull that off, perhaps. So we'll see. And then, Most uh, certainly. And you'll find plenty of help if you go on Facebook or the forum, which you can get through through the website. There's always very helpful people answering questions. It's got to the stage where I, I get to the questions usually within 48 hours, but somebody's already answered now. So um, there's plenty of help out here as well to get you going. So it'd be great to have you aboard. Yeah. That, that has been happening during your presentation. Uh, many of the questions that were asked were already answered by another forum uh, member watching. So yeah, yeah that's so, true. Uh, yeah. So it's been very okay. good. So there we go. Not seeing a whole lot of questions coming up. Uh, again, if I will just uh, continue to chat a little bit. Oh, here you go. Uh, someone said they did a uh, solo can I uh, using tabletop simulator. Okay, I guess that's answering my question. <laughs> and he was yeah. using, using some of the kit for a DBA. I guess it was already out there. Yeah, the bases would be perfect, of course, because they're, uh, they're exactly the same. So, yeah. so that, works, that works pretty nicely. Yeah. Tom, any more thoughts or questions on your side or anything you'd like either of us to expand on at this stage? I, I like, I like uh, the, the idea of the uh, activation variation and the color codes. What, what kind of drove you to come up with that? I was kind of curious because uh, command and control is something I always look at very closely in, in various war game systems. And uh, this one seems to be pretty unique in that respect. And I, I guess you said there's a card deck that you can pull counters or tokens, whatever it is. Yeah, uh, let, let, me, let me see if I can pull something up to show you i think i have to stop sharing first okay okay you should hopefully be able to find an image or two i might go to a little bit more easily sorry just give me a minute and i'll talk as i go yeah so in terms of why um i always felt that the concept of simultaneous movement was obviously the right thing, but we find it difficult to do. So I was thinking to myself, well, in a, in a game system, is there a way I can come up with something that actually starts to get us a little nearer to reality, to simultaneous movement? And that basically was what, what drove me to the interactive system, of saying, okay, I, I think I can, I think I'd come up with something that'll do that. I think, if, I think if we try something where instead of moving your whole army, we move, um, we, we move a bit of it each, then, then react. We're going to get something that's coming up as more simultaneous. And then as I played with it, I realized it was even better because once you split it into phases, you really did get that, that feeling of simultaneous things starting to, uh, starting to happen. So it made, a, it made a big difference. So before I knew it, when I was playing this system in tech, I thought, you know, this actually is, really with a bit of tweaking really quite close to a simultaneous movement version of ancients which is something i've wanted for every every system and then the second plus of it of course is it's super engaging you know you're not sitting there waiting for the other person you're constantly involved in the game uh, which which just felt so much better so um so that was the, that was the rationale of, of where that came from the, uh, the the machinery to do it comes in two forms you have a card pack in fact, Simon's got them there, so if you keep him on screen, he can probably show us. Can you show us that? No, because I'm in my office, not the War Games room, mate. Ah, you're in the wrong place to do it. Okay. I'm <laughs> trying, desperately trying to find an image from, uh, from Dan, but maybe I can do it a different way. Hang on. Well, I did see some of the examples of the cards on the, uh, the videos. Yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to show you this way. I, I have a way of doing it. Let me, uh, I can talk over these. Just give me one second. I'm sure I can pick them out of this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Here we go. I'm just booting up the video that I mentioned earlier, and that will actually allow us to, uh, to do, do something with it. There we go, quick time, that looks promising. Let me see what I've got here.
So what you've got in the, new, in, the, in the old version I had, you have a set of cards which have the colours on one side and they have the, uh, the logo on the other. And I can probably show you some of those because I've got them around somewhere. No, not to have. So, so they had a purple logo. So if I made one slight error, possibly, is I, I emphasise the logo over the look when they went on the table. So what PSC have done, my request, is we produce battle mats. So now the rear of the cards are an exact match to the battle mat with a grey surround. So they disappear on the tabletop. So you can place them down, and even though they're proper playing card size, they won't really interfere with the look of the game. The other alternative is a set of pre-punch command discs. Again, they, they match the rears, and those are, I think, probably 25 millimeter or 30 millimeter. 25, I think, millimeter discs. They're made out of very hard card punch out, and on one side, they've got the command color. On the other side, they've actually got what you need to actually blend into the tabletop. So if you imagine that one where you saw my discs stacked behind the generals, now they're a perfect match, so they sort of disappear into the tabletop. Nice. And, and the dice are 18 millimeter dice with the molded symbols on. So you've got skulls, you've got uh, a, a cross sword, an arrow, you've got an S for special effect, and you've got a blank. And that's the thing I'm trying to boot up, but I think in combination with using Zoom, it's clashing a bit and not enjoying it. Yeah, maybe. So I'm having a few troubles. I don't think it, I don't think it likes the combination, unfortunately. Um, so that's a slight, yeah, a slight challenge to get, but let me. Well, we've had we've had the uh, link for the uh, your website several times in the chat, so folks will be able to go and uh, pull things up. Yeah, right you can see, actually if you go on the website, you'll see it spinning there as standard. Anyway, so they're they're up there already, so they they spin. Away. That's actually a very good idea. If you if you tried going to the website, actually you'll probably see them there actually. So it would uh, it, it it would kick in and people can actually see them. But once you've got these colour devices, the, the to expand on the movement bit, you've always got a table. The table has a set of movement options and the three tree types, and then you have a colour to be able to actually do the do the move. So you spend your chips simplistically to move the tugs and sugs around. When you're in, when you're doing combat or sorry sorry Rob, look look at my screen. You see that? There we go. There's an example of the dice. So you can see them spinning. So when we do combat, it's these dice are done file by file. If you're doing fighting and you're even, you're viewed by the rules to be exactly even. It's a, it's a lottery. Both sides will roll the green dice. Now, if you watch that as it spins, you'll see there's no skull on the black. There's no skull on the white. But there is a skull on the green. So the volatility emerges when you hit the green dice. So green against green, it's quite quite carefully designed statistically. Green against green is quite volatile. And that represents an equal combat being a lottery and quite a dramatic lottery. The minute you're better, so let's say you're the superior Roman against somebody who's average, you stay at green and they drop down to white. So wait for the white one. The white one you'll see has got two wounds on it, but no skull. So now the better troops have got twice the potential of doing damage with their dice and more volatility, more chance of doing something spectacular. And then the system carries on more and more. So if you get two up, three up, four up, you get better and better. So at three up, so in our Watling Street game, superior Romans against average, uphill, uh, with impact weapon and a general, will end up three up against the ancient Britons. So they'll be on a red dice against a white dice. And it keeps going all the way up to after that, you get red plus white, red plus green against a black. You drop to a black. So the very best you get is what we nicknamed the deadly double red against the black. So that would be like being charged in the flank by some Teutonic knights. It wouldn't be much fun. <laughs> so, or, <laughs> elephant, or, or elephants. Or elephants, yeah. So that wouldn't be much fun. And the, and the black dice has got one chance in six of doing one half base of damage. The red dice have got a chance of doing two skills in that one dice roll. So it could kill two bases in that single dice roll. So the system is all set up. So once you've got the hang of your troops, you know your factors because you haven't got many troop types. It becomes extremely quick to know, okay, I'm yellow against white, yellow against white, yellow against white, green against green, green against green. And the thing is very fast moving. So it takes the, the idea of the concept was I wanted to take as much brain strain out of calculations so that it frees up as much brain power to think about what you're doing as a general. Oh, thank so you. So people spend all your time you spend all your time thinking about what to do with your commanders and what decisions to make, because that's, that's where the complication is. The, uh, the, 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 outcome, 
number one criteria for me in new games going forward is don't make me think too hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I think I'd caveat it, I think. Don't make me think too hard about the wrong stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of the thesis of it you know i don't want to have to spend ages working out the i mean in the old days when we did some of our wargaming if we look back with our tables and multiple factors and cross-referencing and going oh yeah that's that's 37 ca oh no i missed one 39 casualties let's write it down and take one base off 19 I mean, we're long beyond the days of ever wanting to do that again so it was fun at the time it had its era but this is this is designed to be uh, easy to pick up and fast moving and the color system is, is the special creation really that drives it all yeah, you definitely inspired me. I'm uh, looking forward to getting to it as quick as possible. So uh, I'll be going online here very shortly. And uh, you <laughs> said the Global Night was the U.S. place, right? Super stuff, yeah. yeah so if there's any other questions or things you want us to expand on, yell. Otherwise, it's been an absolute pleasure. And we'll let you uh, close it off at that. Congratulations right. on running all this. I, I, I hear many sessions have been really superb. I've had some feedback from people who've been on other ones. Yeah, uh, cool. well here. Well. I think yeah, we've had so, up, uh, up close to close to 30 participants at the at the peak. So it's yeah. been great. So uh, I got my, my uh, little script I got to cover. So no dice, no glory dot com and HMGS. We want to thank uh, Simon Elliott and Simon Hall for the time today. Appreciate you coming in. Uh, you're going to be able to find this video later. So if there's anything you'd like to rewind and take a look at, uh, you can go back and uh, it'll be posted here probably within about 30 or 40 minutes on YouTube. And then uh, I'm looking forward to following with you all on the uh, your, your your own website and your uh, your upcoming events. Uh, uh, I don't know by August 29th I'll be ready to jump into the uh, uh, glo global uh, uh, megatron, but <laughs> mega was it megatron? Megathon. Mega megathon. <laughs> megathon. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, little little transformers uh, slip there. They but, did, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. No well, you know they did bring out a movie about a giant shark after yeah. the rules, yeah. so you know you can't really compare. <laughs> So, so I've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I will certainly uh, stay in touch with you guys. And I uh, hope everybody else yeah, well. so. yeah, everybody welcome. All right. Well, let Keep me enjoy. Stop. Thank recording. you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. All right.